dan Sajak sebagai seorang yang yang membesarkan mereka memang Sajak rindu of course Memang Sajak rindu mereka Anak-anak Sajak siapa, siapa yang jaga diorang sekarang? Untuk sekarang ni memang mak ayah Sajak yang jaga dan um, mereka dalam keadaan baik-baik saja dan untuk saya maklumkan bahawa bawaan jaga anak Sajak ni adalah bawaan jaga jaga atas nama mak ayah Sajak. So benda ni tak ada apa-apa isu dan Sajak sebagai seorang yang yang membesarkan mereka memang Sajak rindu of course Memang saya jadi indom mereka. Um, tapi saya tak boleh nak kata apa-apa. Uh, saya perlukan teruskan saya punya anggota petu perjalanan saja. Biarlah mereka dalam keadaan selamat uh, dekat uh, sana bersama ibu ayah saya. Dan saya hanya di sini saya rasa memberi apa tu. Uh, Elawan-elawan pada mereka Untuk mereka Apa tu Teruskan kehidupan mereka Therefore we should stay Well away from them All the Muslim scholars of the past Have advised us That the person Or the one who knows not And knows not He knows not These are people Who are worse than donkeys Well, first of all, Islam is not a religion for fools. These people are fools. Therefore, they shouldn't think that they can use religion. And if I say them or these people, we're talking about the government of the day. Whether it be this government, the previous government, the government before that, all of them come from the same cloth. They don't listen to advice. They don't want to listen to good advice. They think they know when in fact they don't know. And they refuse to admit that. That's that's what we call arrogance. When you know not, and you know not, you know not, you are arrogant. Therefore, we should stay Well away from them, all the Muslim scholars of the past have advised us that the person or the one who knows not and knows not, he knows not. These are people who are worse than donkeys, obstinate, and therefore stay well clear of them. And yet here we are putting them as a part, as our leadership and our government. It's not right. What kind of a people are we going to become? I mean, look at the whole, the whole uh, political instability in this country. It's a racial, racist kind of thing, and it's not right. We deserve better. They are more apt to be described or to be labeled as wakil parti, bukan wakil rakyat. Because any decision made by them, I doubt they have ever consulted with the people they represent. Never. Well, in the first place, I think let us not forget that uh, now all the elected representatives are given the, uh, the title Yang Berhormat in Bahasa Malaysia, uh, the Honourable. Honorable, and uh, they are supposed to represent the aspiration of the people. But the way I look at it, so far, the YBs or the uh, Wakil Rakyat, uh, they are more apt to be described or to be labeled as Wakil Parti. Wakil Parti, bukan Wakil Rakyat. Because any decision made by them, I doubt they have ever consulted with the people they represent. Never. And uh, whether or not they consulted their party bosses again, that I would call that into question.
apakah hasrat anda terhadap politik di negeri Melaka dan juga negara Malaysia secara umpamanya? What, what is your wish? I'm looking forward for a stable government. Saya rasa saya, this is not only me lah, mengumumkan hasrat kepada semua pengundi-pengundi dan juga penduduk uh, seluruh Malaysia. We need a stable government di mana kita mempunyai uh, kematangan dalam membuat uh, keputusan dan pada masa yang sama kita juga membuat mempunyai kematangan dalam mengambil uh, mengambil uh, taking up a stand on policy matters. So which is where which is where it is very much lacking. Let it be in the state level ataupun in parliament level. So that is my my hope and request. So Nana pula apakah, apakah hasrat anda bukan saja untuk negeri Melaka tapi negara Malaysia? Okay, okay. Um, <coughs> sejujurnya Nana memang nak tengok kan perubahan di negara kita. Jadi um, dengan adanya di Nana dan dengan adanya Danish uh, sebagai calon, ia bukanlah satu peluang pada diri kita untuk elevate atau personal stepping stone. Tapi macam Nana cakap awal-awal tadi, ini merupakan uh, tanda aras untuk semua anak muda bukan cuma untuk memahami politik tapi juga untuk buktikan kepada semua orang kat luar sana yang walaupun kita ni tiada cukup pengalaman ataupun kita ni terlalu muda tapi kita mampu mentakbir, anak muda mampu memimpin dan juga uh, anak muda sendiri mampu menjadi contoh dan anak muda mampu membuat perubahan. Jadi kalau tanya uh, Nana apa hasrat atau visi Nana untuk politik ni, Nana memang nak ramai lagi anak muda untuk bersama-sama uh, sertai politik dan kita lakukan perubahan. Kita okay. mengamalkan politik yang berteraskan nilai. Assalamualaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to yet another episode of What's Going On Malaysia. My name is Harith Eskanda. Seperti biasa, I am right here in uh, my studio at home, and I am looking forward tonight to, to connecting with you, everyone who's watching online. If you're watching live on this Sunday night, What's the Hari Bulan? Today is uh, 765, Lima Hari Bulan, December. Uh, please, welcome to the show. Please uh, comment in the comment section. Let us know that you are watching. Let us know where you are watching from. Uh, I know that um, many, many times we have a lot of people watching from all over the place, all over the world. Asnil is watching, Sandiran is watching. We'll be bringing up your comments uh, right here in the section here. Chandran, uh, good evening, Harith. Hope to be a good show. I hope it's a good show as well. In fact, I can pretty much guarantee with the quality of guests that I have tonight, that it will be a good show. Uh, second of all, let me know uh, if technically everything is okay. The sound, can you hear the sound? Can you hear? Can you see? If it's all good, we will power on. Brian Kwan is watching from Kalanajaya. Third, please share this live streaming. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, you can share to your Facebook page. If you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, copy the link and share it into your WhatsApp groups and encourage your friends to listen and watch the show. Because tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very, a very special guest, someone that I have uh, connected with over Twitter. And uh, I, I've enjoyed um, watching his, uh, his thought process through Twitter, as well as uh, reading and watching him uh, on the social media, but uh, I, it's not about me enjoying it. It's about you guys as well and learning and finding out about things. MJ from Sabah, Apakabar Sabah. Thank you for watching. And also, 
if you're listening to this on Spotify, because after the show, this gets put up on Spotify. If you don't know about this, please go to Spotify, type in What's Going On Malaysia, and you will see all the episodes up there so you can listen to it while you are jogging, while you are driving, while you are just like just hanging out, or a while your uh, partner is speaking to you and you don't want to hear what they're saying, you just put the earphones on, nod along, and listen to What's Going On Malaysia. Guys, tonight, um, my guest is a gentleman who um, is very experienced and learned in the ways of Malaysian politics. Uh, not so much probably in terms of years. I mean, he's, he's not been in politics for 30 or 40 years like some people, but I guarantee you the knowledge he has, the stories he has, and the insights that he will share will definitely put you in a spot that you were not at at the beginning of the show. Now, why do I say this? Because I've already had a brief conversation with him. And uh, as he was talking, I had to tell him to stop. I didn't want to hear anymore because I wanted to be as astounded, as amazed, and perhaps even as confused and flabbergasted. I've been looking for a way to use that word, flabbergasted. Dalam Bahasa Malaysia, orang kata, there is no word. There is no word for flabbergasted. Flabbergasted. Akan dimasukkan ke dalam Dewan Bahasa um, dan Pustaka dalam 2-3 minggu lagi. Perkataan flabbergasted. In other words, I can't wait. I can't wait to bring him on. So I'm going to do that straight away. Uh, please wave your hands in the air and <laughs> wave them like you just don't care. I know that's an old hip-hop phrase. Uh, please welcome into the show Dato' Dr. Rais Hussein. Welcome, my good sir. How are you? I'm good, uh, especially after... I will win yesterday against uh, Wolves. Uh, ah. <laughs> For those of you who may not be watching, maybe listening to this, I would just like to let you know that uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Rice Hussein is wearing a Liverpool jersey the third colour for this season. Uh, and coincidentally, right behind me on the wall is a Liverpool jersey signed by Robbie Fowler, which lets you know that we happen to support the same team. I'm not going to say too much about that, except you'll never walk alone. How long have you been supporting Liverpool? Right. Uh, since I know football, it has been ages, uh, during the great glory days. And then uh, obviously we... Uh, we took a slumber for a while and uh, we are back with the bang. We are back with the bang. Kepada mereka yang uh, tidak meminati bola ataupun specifically a Liverpool Football Club, well, you know, too bad. You know, you, you, if you want to learn something, follow the best and we definitely follow the best. <laughs> okay, enough about Liverpool. Oh no, before that, you just told me just now that you have a room in your house called the Liverpool Room. What yes. is in this Liverpool Room? Well, uh, we have some, uh, just like your Robbie Fowler jersey, we have uh, Kenny Daglish and Gerard. Uh, I think two of the best players ever Liverpool have uh, had. Absolutely. Uh, I got some uh, things uh, when I, I used to go for Liverpool games those days uh, when there was no COVID. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I managed to meet up once uh, with someone called Mo Salah. And uh, oh, so well, that, that some, guy. Yeah, that guy. The guy who cannot stop scoring or making goals. So, <laughs> so that guy. So, and and uh, a lot of historical artifacts and uh, on uh, the first Liverpool jersey, for instance, was not red. It was actually half blue, half white. So, so it's this interesting collections I have uh, over the uh, space and time that I've collected. Uh, Liverpool. Ooh. I remember when my 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 doctor who did a quadruple bypass on me told me that uh, when he cut open my heart he saw the Liverpool engraved in the heart so to that <laughs> we have just spent um, the first five minutes uh, connecting on a different level which most people will not understand but already we are friends for life with that uh, may I call you uh, Rice? Rice. Call Rice, you Rice? Yes. Okay. with that Rice um, I believe, uh, and you can confirm, that uh, you were one of the founding members of Bersatu. Uh, and uh, in your own words, you were literally there from step one, day one, the, the first day the brick was laid. Uh, is that true? And, and perhaps you could just spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about that. Explain yeah, very about that. quickly, uh, I think from ground zero. Uh, 
uh, on the day that Tan Sri Mohidin was uh, at that point of time uh, sacked unethically by uh, the kleptomaniacs uh, from being a deputy prime minister. And uh, that is the day that I went to see him. Uh, I was among the last one to leave his house. And I spoke to him. And, and since then, uh, I had to leave most of my corporate world involvement. And I believe that we need to start a, a new political party uh, to combat what was happening then. Now, obviously, uh, uh, Tun Mahadeir had a lot of uh, things to say about this. So uh, they arranged a meeting for me to meet up with Tun Mahadeir at his house uh, in uh, uh, that Sungabasi area there. And I went there, uh, set up, sat with him for almost two hours. The first one hour descriptively telling what is happening in Malaysia, similar to what's going on in Malaysia, uh, talking about the uh, endemicity of corruption, uh, the theft of the nation, and so on and so forth, very descriptively. The other one that he said, uh, right, there are many people who came, sat exactly on the chair that you are sitting now, telling me exactly what you were telling. And then when I take their phone number and call them, they never come or show up for the meetings. So I told him that, uh, or suggested to him that, uh, I'm not here just to tell you descriptively. I'm here with a plan. So he says, you are here with a plan? I say, yes. Uh, uh, then he asked me, what's my background? So I just quickly tell him that I'm, I've been always in a corporate setting. And then he said, okay, let's hear your plan. My plan is we need to set up a Malay-based party. Uh, and, and I will explain to you why it should be Malay-based party. Uh, the reason is uh, if any other party like Malaysian-based party, uh, we will be uh, rejected immediately, instantaneously, given the crowd. At that time, Najib had all the powers that be and uh, all the wherewithal with him to paint us as Pankiana. So I told him that it has to be a Malay-based party. And then it has to have five core principles. Number one, uh, which is uh, moderation, which is very, very important. Number two, inclusiveness, which is important. Number uh, three, reform, important. And justice, important and progressive. This must be the five core principles of that party that we need to establish, which is a Malay-based party. Secondly, we must form an, an unimaginable coalition with uh, PKR, uh, DAP and Amana. We alone cannot win. And then we should come up with uh, our own uh, offering to the people what we are going to do uh, if we win. And those were the plans that I was outlaying to him. He was listening very attentively, uh, Tun Mahadev, for almost two hours. Huh? And then he told me, okay, we shall call you for a meeting. And then when the meeting was called, there was about 35 people, including all the luminaries that you can imagine of, uh, Lim Leong Sik, uh, Kadeh Jassin, everyone, Tan Sri Mohidin, uh, Mukris, of course, everyone. And, and during that meeting, uh, I repeated again once more, uh, we have to tectonically change if you want to fight the kleptocrats or kleptomaniac. We cannot uh, ch challenge them within the game, uh, the rules that they, they write. For instance, you want to do a signature campaign, it's going to be a waste of time. You want to do this, it's going to be a waste of time. Let us tectonically change, set up this party. And I repeated the same thing. Uh, Tun Mahadeir at that point of time decided that no, uh, we will go for the signature campaign. Uh, if you remember, I can't even remember the, the words that he used, but uh, the signature campaign involving a lot of Malaysians, get that knee, and forcing Amno to uh, make the change. So in that meeting also I said, there's no way you're going to change through Amno. Amno is the best multi-level marketing in the world. Uh, the topmost uh, uh, robs billions. Uh, the middle robs millions, and then hundreds of thousands, and then hundreds and fifties. So it's so patronage system. You cannot break it with, with uh, signatures, uh, and, and that will not work. So, but he, he in his own uh, wisdom, uh, said no. So we went for this uh, signature campaign. And then the signature campaign happened and uh, didn't pro provide the... Uh, Padamani, the desired outcome, and uh, he tried his best actually to talk to the 
apa nama ni royalties as well pun did not happen then one night i was called for a meeting by tan sri mohidin yasin's officers so i went for the meeting at his house and there were five of us uh, tan sri mohidin uh, tun mahadev mukris shafi abdal and myself five of us and we have a chat and that's when tun mahadev said that look yes we must go ahead establish a party this was few months after the after the initial and that's when the decision was made who's the president and who's the pengerusi there was some discussion why do we need a pengerusi and president which i have a differing view but at the end of the day that was decided bersatu will not go to sabah shafi abdal uh, was happy so he can form his own party in in sabah and that's how it all came about and then immediately we start working on the logos on the on the constitution uh, on the background and to get it done okay uh, so race uh, that i think okay from the part that you were uh, intrinsically involved uh, i think generally the public believes that tun uh, came up with the idea uh, probably you know from by himself but uh, i'm i'm kind of familiar with the the characters that you have mentioned especially the five that were in that room um everything you say is basically i think what the country at that time voted for in 2018 all the um, all the principles that you mentioned and all the changes that uh, uh, you know you, everyone intends to make and the manifesto itself uh, just just jumping forward did you could you have foreseen at that time uh, what has happened in the last year and a half or even two years absolutely no because remember i i'm not a politician i was never was a politician so i couldn't imagine that after we fight so hard we fought so hard uh, to win over and then we uh, we face this kind of circumstances that we are facing now i think that was uh, something of a big and immense uh, disappointment uh, on on my side uh, i've been always telling people that uh, we started out well uh, alhamdulillah we started out well Uh, we had a common uh, battleground uh, we have a common uh, enemy to defeat uh, we want to change we want to reform and that's why the manifest the manifesto was not written uh, from the skies and the moon you know kind of thing that some people are saying and uh, i i was the chair of the manifesto writing uh, in that committee we had uh, ong kyang ming dr ong kyang ming a duke a graduate uh, you have dr zul Uh, who was uh, is is a chemical what uh, chemical something that is i mean you have brilliant people in that particular group and uh, we debated almost 7 to 8 months and went through engagement with almost every stakeholders that you can think of in malaysia and then brought to uh, respective parties respective uh, we have uh, the bureau politic or whatever in in every party so it was brought through that bureau politic once that is done comes to uh, this particular central committee uh, in the and there we present it at the ph presidential council and everyone bought in of course there are some who wants extreme right some wants extreme left being someone in the middle i have to moderate it and that's how the manifesto was actually produced uh, there was uh, some more people involvement uh, in that Uh, Sim, uh, for instance, from PKR, he contributed a lot. Uh, so we have everyone involved. That manifesto is a genuine manifesto. Uh, it's a hard work of many, uh, for the many, not for the few. Okay, I, I understand that. Um, in hindsight, uh, we are now two years past uh, the infamous Sheraton move. Um, the mumblings on the ground is that, if we're looking at history here, the mumblings on the ground is that. Ah, uh, Pakatan didn't even do what they was they they said they were going to do. Uh, yes, given that it was only a very short term, but they didn't even achieve a little bit of that. Or uh, it almost seems like uh, what a waste of time. This is you know to the people who feel they voted for change, but change didn't happen. So, in your experience, what went wrong? On the contrary, let me just explain here. Yeah? Uh, in that manifesto, we had 10 promises within the first 100 days and uh, 60 promises within the first five years. And uh, all that was written uh, carefully. 
uh, choreographed carefully. And obviously, based on uh, information that we were able to get publicly on the state of affairs in terms of financials and so on, including the debt levels, including uh, the PTPTN uh, status and so on. It's all public information that we relied upon. Having said that, obviously, after the election, there were some attempts to uh, disregard the manifesto. On the contrary, on the first PH Presidential Council after the election, I suggested in that PH Presidential Council, being a PH Presidential Council member at that point of time, uh, representing Basatu, we set up Manifesto Monitoring Committee. And this Manifesto Monitoring Committee must be independent of the cabinet, independent of the politician. And what we need to do is take all the promises that we've made and then uh, do a, a kind of like a mirror and make it against the ministries. That means like every ministry have these particular deliverables and make that as a KPI. So that was the uh, idea of a manifesto monitoring committee. Uh, by and large, everyone supported it, uh, except Tun Mahathir, who said that uh, this should come under cabinet because it's a very critical thing. I still remember in the pre PH Presidential Council, I said, you cannot mark your own exam papers. So, uh, and uh, that was my last PH Presidential Council at meeting. Are you saying you had a fallout with Tun? I didn't have a fallout with Tun. I, I've been always respectful of him. I... I learned a lot from him huh, since 2015 uh, because at that point of time, the motivation was only one, to reform, to change, to, you know, to, to bring a new Malaysia, new politics and so on. So I, I totally believed in, in him and I, uh, to a personal cost of mine, I've done a lot of things. Of course, uh, uh, if you talk to Tun Mahade, he'll always say that I'm either Tansi Mohedin's man or uh, Anwar's man or, you know, sometimes... Uh, in all the history of time, I always, somebody's man. I cannot be a racist man. But if you look at uh, the facts on the ground, uh, I've been always stating my points. Even uh, when there's a difference of views with uh, Tan Sri Mohidin, uh, even when he was the PM, I articulate that to my personal cause again. But that is uh, the, 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 beside the point. What I was stressing upon is that manifesto is a promise that we made. And the good news is that about 60 to 70 percent of the manifesto doesn't involve money. It is involving reforms and uh, the rest involving money. And of course, there are some we delivered. Uh, I think uh, the good news is that after he comes out and saying that manifesto is not a kitab suci or, or Bible or something, and I responded by saying that it is true that uh, manifesto is not a Bible. It is actually Quran for him. Uh, he has to fulfill the promises. And of course, uh, every time then, we will always have this uh, back and forth. And he would say that, hey, you are a self-proclaimed strategist. But he forgot that uh, on the day of first meeting of Supreme Council, he's the one who appointed me as a uh, chief strategist or strategist, uh, uh, Pengurusi Bureau, Strategy and Dasa. So if you translate that to English, these days, uh, Dewan Bahasa Pustaka needs to do the translation, I guess. So some... Journalists use the word chief strategist. I've never claimed that. But in all my op-eds, at the end there, I'll always put uh, Ketua Pengurusi uh, Biro Dasar dan Strategi. So so what happens is that uh, I said, we need to implement the manifesto. And the good news is that Tun Mahathir listens. Huh? Walaupun dia marah dengan saya and whatever, he listened. On the first anniversary of uh, Pakatan Harapan, the first 15 minutes of the speech was focused on manifesto. And he told what has been done, what has not been done, blah, 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 and so on. So manifesto is back. So I think uh, for 22 months, uh, all of them are working hard. Uh, obviously, some of them are working hard in a different way. But most of them are working hard to uh, engender the change uh, so needed in Malaysia that has put us into such a backwater these days. And uh, then Sheraton happens. Then uh, but Sheraton happens not just because of that group of people. It was pull and push. Okay. Moving forward. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your sharing of the history up to that point. Moving forward, where does Basatu stand now? What is the difference between Basatu PH and Basatu PN? Um, uh, uh, from a general point of view, it doesn't 
it doesn't look too strong at the moment. Uh, what what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, I think before I come there, just a little bit uh, uh, history. Uh, the Sheraton, right? The Sheraton mm -hmm. happened. If you notice, uh, the Sheraton happened on Sunday evening. On Friday evening, uh, there was this PH Presidential Council and Tun Mahade uh, got what he wanted, that is Prime Minister until after APEC uh, 2020, at least at that point of time. And uh, he decides when he will go. And then on Sunday morning, uh, we had the PPBM Supreme Council, Bursato Supreme Council. He got what he wanted as well, i.e. he decides, uh, th that meeting I did not attend, uh, as a, although I'm a Supreme Council, because I was not uh, healthy. I was recovering from quadruple bypass. But at that meeting, uh, it was agreed that he remains the sole candidate as a Prime Minister for Bersatu. And uh, he decides whether we Bersatu will leave PH. And of course, in that meeting, there's quite uh, uh, differing views. And, uh, and, and some want, some do not want it. But uh, those who do not want it uh, were also very like senior, like Mukres, like Sadiq, like, you know, these are the good guys eh, who, who, who didn't want to leave PH. Then on Sunday night, there was the dinner. Uh, and Monday morning, Tun Mahade resigned. And uh, we didn't know. The Supreme Council didn't know that he resigned. Um, uh, the PH president Wait, didn't know. The Supreme, the Supreme Council of Basatu were not know. informed. No, we were not informed. I asked the president himself, Tan Sri Mohidin. He didn't know. I didn't know. I got to know through uh, Awani news ticker that uh, submission of the letter, Kak uh, Istada. And, uh, well, uh, PH Presidential Council didn't know. So all of them rushed and uh, trying to talk him out of it and so on. Later at that night, Monday night, we had a Tergempala, Bersatu Supreme Council meeting. And in that meeting, uh, uh, despite I was told that I'm a Tansi man and you know, I was the first one who said that we cannot let this thing happen. Uh, we need to uh, reach back to him. He remains the sole candidate as our prime minister. And I remember I requested Mukris, that was Sri Mukris, to call in the meeting to, to, to uh, Tone so that immediately we can dispatch uh, the senior leaders uh, to see him. He may not want to see me, but see the senior leaders. So to, to, to stop this thing, because we are in the, quite progressing and if there's any problems, it has to be resolved properly, amicably. So he did call. Mukris did call. But uh, unfortunately, uh, Tun Siti Hasma told on the phone saying that uh, he is still, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's already asleep. So yeah, he's already asleep. And uh, then we decided uh, next morning we will go that the senior leader, the Bureau of Politics will go and meet up with him to persuade him to, 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 to withdraw from resigning. And uh, as a chairman, first we said the decision was we reject his resignation as the chairman of uh, Pengurusi of Bersatu. And then we asked him to uh, uh, withdraw the resignation of the prime ministership. So that's what happened the next morning. So he went, uh, they, they went, uh, and uh, he said he will consider. That's the word that was used. In between, there's a lot of other things happening in the background uh, already. And uh, that's when all things happen in the way it happened uh, eventually. And Tun Mahathir again attempted to be the Prime Minister. But this time around, he doesn't want any political party punya, uh, restrictions. So that is one thing. And secondly, uh, uh, by that time, Tan Sri also had some support. And that's when he started staking a claim. And then you know these guys from past and also these guys from those who were in PKR before uh, who then left. And they also started supporting Tan Sri and uh, rest is history. Uh, but but that's, a, that's a sad history to know. Lah. But coming back, uh, back to the future sekarang, ke depan, uh, where is Bersatu? Uh, do we even know... Uh, what Bersatu is actually now. Because Bersatu now is a, a little bit different, a lot different from Bersatu that we we worked hard to find and anchor and, and everything. And this is uh, predominantly many of the views because uh, some of those who uh, 
join uh, Bersatu after that uh, has essentially take, taken uh, a large chunk of decision-making process and uh, therefore uh, obviating the, the, the older guys, uh, the older young guys. Some of them left to Pejuang, some of them left to uh, Muda and all that. So, but even those who are remaining, they have been also obviated in a, uh, obviated from making decision. So the new Bersatu, uh, just like Amno Baru, we have Bersatu Baru. Uh, Tansri is still the president. Uh, he, I mean, many people will always say, Rais, you are you are loyalist to Tansri. He's actually a good man. Uh, he's a very nice man. The only problem and challenge is that people around him, uh, the those who apa nama ni yang circumambulate uh, tawaf around him and ring fence him <laughs> and you know, those kind of things so but uh, be that as may i think bersatu what we see bersatu now is very different from bersatu that we all founded together to fight uh, kleptomaniacs and uh, uh, and 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 to instill the idea of reform and change in country for the many Okay, uh, thank you very much. I've just been reading the comments. I think there has been a lot of misconceptions about who you are and the role you played and whose, inverted commas, man you are, as you said in your own words. You always seem to be somebody's man. But uh, uh, I think from your own words, your, your, your vision, your clarity is, is basically remained the same, is to basically have a better Malaysia, if I may use uh, my own words here. Um, on that point, let's talk about this. And I do hope everyone out there is sharing this Facebook post or a YouTube. If you have not shared it, please take two seconds to share it now because uh, not only is what has been said, it's been quite uh, eye-opening for me. I think we're going to get into some even more interesting territory right now. Let's talk about, it's very clear what your vision has been or, or always has been from that point when you say Tantri Mahidin was... Uh, um, you know, uh, well, I can't remember the word you used. Uh, not unceremoniously, you said Tantri Mudin was unethically sacked. By unethically the sacked. Okay. Today, 2021, we're coming to the end of 2021. Uh, I think even Sheraton Move almost seems like a world away. And since then, we've had what, two, three, four, eight prime ministers? I've kind of lost count. I blink and it changes. Uh, <laughs> Where does Malaysia stand today? And uh, if you may share just from a general point of view, and then we'll probably get into, you know, what can be done and what, what would, would be your role in this. So where does Malaysia stand today? Where are we, honestly speaking? And let, let's just be open and frank about this. I, I, think, um, um, I think the pandemic, COVID-19, made it worse. Uh, we could have managed it a little bit better. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even MA Research, the think tank that I helm, uh, we produced a 34-pager uh, of uh, the recovery plan, which includes a uh, pandemic recovery plan, economic reco recovery plan, uh, mitigating education, and also uh, national reconciliation. Because I think all four is very uh, critical towards uh, better Malaysia, uh, borrowing your word, Harit. Uh, why? Uh, if you do not manage the pandemic, uh, I mean, we know how pandemic has resulted uh, in severe economic conditions until today. Yeah? Uh, some of the statistics, the horrifying statistics that we see, that uh, we are looking forward to, uh, we are looking to see uh, huge bankruptcies next year uh, on on the private uh, private uh, individuals and so on. I, uh, I'll be writing an op-ed on this, inshallah, and I will share this as always publicly. Uh, these are all numbers, numbers uh, from uh, you know, uh, source, uh, official source. Yeah? And we are worried, we are worried, we are concerned. So pandemic management was one uh, issue that we had. Uh, then the whole, all hell broke loose was the Sabah election, uh, which was really, really un un unnecessary. Uh, that really uh, aggravated the problem. Uh, and, uh, and since then, every, all these things happening. And I think earlier, uh, we also tried to do a confidence supply bill. Uh, a very young man called Said Sadiq, uh, he is very mature for his age, actually. And this guy uh, thought about that, that saying that we need stability. You cannot have a government that is weak. So he actually initiated uh, 
the confidence supply bill, and he spoke to various uh, political. I was involved in that as well. Uh, Bersatu, uh, uh, DAP, and and apa nama ni, uh, PKR, and everyone. And actually, we came up with a particular consensus. This was one year, uh, about one year ago. Eh? Uh, and uh, but in the eleventh hour, before that con- confidence supply bill can be signed, uh, some brainy bunch in the in the Bersatu have uh, decided not to uh, sign it. Instead, they want to get MPs individually, meaning which, uh, okay, Sadiq, you sign. Okay, you sign. Oh, you sign. We do not want end block. Then I said, okay, that was the first early warning signal that the government is going to have a few challenges. You cannot run an administration uh, with the blackmail of uh, of certain group of people. Uh, in Amno, for instance, there is something called cluster makama, uh, and and some people who lost in the G14 uh, who doesn't like this particular collaboration. They agreed to the collaboration just to ensure that PH4. The moment PH4, the next agenda is how do we become the anchor dominant government again? So that is all that they are thinking for. Although I'm not very politically uh, uh, been there for a long time, but it's very easy to read these people's uh, uh, very common game, and that's what exactly happened. So the blackmail continued. Uh, the the confidence supply bill was rejected. Then uh, uh, they did it. Tan Sri uh, fall. And a new guy came in, and then we had the MOU was signed. That MOU is essentially reflective of what the confidence supply bill uh, was to be signed. It was ready actually at that point of time, but it was it was not signed. And uh, um, that, that, that's a sad sad story. Uh, and this was initiated by Sadiq, a, a very young uh, chap uh, who I, I think is uh, too uh, very mature for his age. Now, if you well, look at yeah. this, yeah, yeah, Carry you, on. You, and he spoke to everyone. He went and you know he tried and so on. Uh, uh, every other uh, monkeys and uh, and donkeys. Uh, <laughs> I thought that's now Said Hussein. Said somebody said donkeys. Yeah? So every monkeys and donkeys are establishing a party. Uh, his party is still not approved. I mean, uh, I mean, in a democratic world, uh, you you should uh, you should encourage the youth to be involved in politics. Uh, well, this again yes. is to the, the reason why uh, we are. Now, if you look at where we are today, I think the big problem that we are facing now is the uh, corruption. Uh, okay. Corruption in every sense of the word. And Let, let's talk about that because uh, yeah, everybody has for for at least I can remember the last eight to ten years the word has become part of the the vocabulary of Malaysians when we talk about not just politics when we talk about living in Malaysia, the word corruption, um, you know, pops up more than once a day on anyone's conversation. What is, okay, I'm not going to, we could talk about this for hours. It is a problem. Yes, it is a problem. Why has it become such a problem? And what what can we as the general public, those people who are watching and sharing this Facebook and YouTube live be doing? What can we do about it? You see, corruption used to be, as what you said, a problem in Malaysia. Today, it's a way of life. If you are not corrupt, hey, what's wrong with you? Are you all right? Are you okay? It has been so normalized. Uh, so it's just like the Palestinian, I mean, uh, the Israeli atrocities in Palestine, right? It has been so normalized. People, da, 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 ah, okay, fine. It doesn't touch me. I'm all right. But they do not understand corruption as a huge significant impact in people's life. We lose, uh, recently, uh, uh, Dr. Osamuddin, the Raswa Busters, uh, which I co-founded with uh, Osamuddin, uh, uh, came about talking about uh, Malaysia apparently losing 40 billion ringgit to 60 billion ringgit annually to corruption and uh, and due to corrupt practice. And then another 1.8 trillion ringgit through illegal financial flows uh, that happened from 2005 to 2014. That is massive, boss. That's about 180 oh. billion annually for those 10 years. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, corruption has become much. Like, uh, I can take the money and buy a Hermes bag or pink diamond, or I can buy a yak without a feel of rasa malu, uh, saying uh, feel that 
this is uh, this is actually a, a, a theft. I think uh, uh, if I may share this, uh, this book was written by Professor Muhammad Kamal Hassan, and this guy has never written in his 79 years of life uh, on politics, never. And now he has written a book on this, saying corruption and hypocrisy in Malay Muslim politics. But of course, he uh, he offers the urgency of moral ethical transformation. Now, in his book, he did talk about hilangnya rasa malu. For them, rasuah is all right. It is okay. I'm doing a favor for you so I can take the money. But we do not... The Quran is very clear, boss, that rasuah is haram. And even worse haram, I, I remember that uh, Dato Ayub, uh, he said that uh, makan babi dengan rasuah ni sama haramnya. My view is that Makan hinzir is only yourself. When you take corruption, you are impacting many others. It is even worse than makan babi. And unfortunately, that has become a, 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 a an endemic, a, a, a way of life. So the, then we all know, we listen to uh, uh, what we call a cartel. Uh, cartel daging lah, cartel government contract la cartel uh, name it uh, recently we even have cartel grants uh, grants means like it's a free money from the government uh, through uh, disbursed through the agency and these grants are then uh, uh, retrieved using creative mind they have their own ecosystem there you have the grant runners you have the grant facilitators uh, grant approvers so on and the money is then siphoned out and that do we have anyone address this issue? No. Uh, Hamza Zainuddin, the current uh, Home Minister, talked about immigration cartel. I mean, I mean, can you imagine even the immigrant? I mean, people coming into Malaysia, they can have some ways to come into Malaysia. So who is coming into Malaysia? So these are cartels everywhere. This is another big problem that Malaysia is facing, all because the root cause is. Uh, I think the, the the moral foundation is gone. Everybody are, uh, going after Hermes bags and and uh, Porsche cars and this and that, and then they forget uh, they are doing this in the expense of the many. Only few benefits okay. from it. I just want to address this statement from Arnold Hui, who said that corruption is everywhere, not just the political sphere in Malaysia. Arnold, of course you are correct, corruption is everywhere, but uh, just because it is everywhere does not mean that we do not want to eradicate it right here in Malaysia. And I think what uh, uh, Rais uh, uh, is talking about right now is the the pre prevalence. Oh, hold on, you've just I've just lost my, my, my camera. I'm just going to change it for a moment. There we go. Okay, so what we're talking about now is how it has become a way of life. Uh, you've been around for a while, uh, Dr. Rice. Um, was it always like this? Or, or can, you, can you pinpoint a particular time when you say the moral decay began to happen? I think Prof. Kamal Hassan uh, wrote in his book, uh, and he spoke on his book, uh, it begins right after the 1969 uh, May tragedy where the new economic policy was introduced and the new economic policy introduced to uh, remove the racial identification with the economic function and all that, which is a good policy. Huh? Uh, I'm a supporter of a new economic policy. It's a good policy. On paper, the problem was with the implementation. Why was the problem with the implementation? It benefited the 2%, not the 98% of the Malays. And therefore, you see a super rich Malays and the super poor Malays. So that's why it contributed to income inequality. And then when these things happen, how are they going to make their ends meet? Uh, the guy who wrote about saying it's just not the politics elsewhere, I think he's right. Uh, let's take the civil servant. We have about what? 1.2, 1.3 million civil servants. And if you look at that, uh, in one of the United Nations report, it was stated very clearly one of the reasons civil servants uh, engaged in this corruption and corrupt practice is because they fall into what we call the debt trap, uh, hutang. Uh, how do they fall into the debt trap? The banks are very uh, laser fair in giving them loans. And they get loans, they buy this, they buy that, this buy. And then 
the take home pay will become very, very small or, or disposable income monthly will become very small. So what they do do? So then they go to uh, ability to earn uh, money to because there are so many uh, steps and so many of these things. Okay, you pay, you pay the toll. So there are many things. It is just not the politician. Politician have been facing the brunt of it. Why? Because they are the public face. Remember, who implements everything is the civil servant. It, who impl- But again, not all civil servant. It will be probably the top people. I I know so, a, a particular top. Uh, KSU actually uh, uh, interfered into uh, an agency uh, punya apa nama ni? Uh, uh, management and uh, he will have his own meetings with the people from that particular agency and he does things his way. So I think he is very right. It is across, across. And the problem is today, uh, I was with somebody the other day for a dinner uh, and he was telling me his history uh with regard to running some colleges uh with the education ministry i got to you buy kalau you tak bayar we will come after you we will not approve this we will not do this we will create problem and he almost got bankrupt because of that and uh, and then he said okay fine i'm not going to participate in this kind of uh, issues so but he is a good muslim so the thing is uh how are we going to solve this that's why uh, i was telling myself Uh, even uh, recently, I was in MDEC for 15 months. Uh, I was trying to go uh, on the on the on the course of cleaning up and all that. Uh, then I realized you cannot clean on the branch on the leaves. You can't. You need to go down the root, and the root is here is the uh, the power, the political power, and that is why uh, we need uh, the political will. Uh, and 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 the people must 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 do this again one more time, because if in GE 15 we get it wrong, Malaysia will have a huge massive problem. I don't know whether we will uh, will come back. Okay, let me give you a point of view since you have brought it up, uh, and I'll go back to uh, MDAC in just a moment. Yeah, so you you are saying that oh in G 15 we need to get it right. Well, uh, what would you say that, uh, let's say, uh, I have the opinion that it actually doesn't matter who you vote in, the system remains the same. So let's say you choose the best that you think, uh, you vote for the best party or the best person that you think can make the change, but the system is still the same. So in my opinion, doesn't matter who you vote in, nothing really will change. And I think, uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself here, this is what I felt Uh, after 2018 until today, um, you know there was great hope for great change, and nothing really changed. And then I I come to the realization that that's because the system is set in stone. You can change the train driver or the engineer of a train, but if the tracks don't change, no matter what driver you put in the in the driver's seat, you're going to get the same result. You think my anything view, can change in GA15? My view is this, Hari. Um, I think we should uh, uh, elect. Uh, uh, a candidate uh, who's qualified, who's capable. They are uh, available across the aisle. Eh? It is not just this side or that side. They, they are. Uh, they are good candidates. I mean, I can name uh, KJ as one good candidate. Syed Sadiq is one candidate. Nurul Iza, I always call her as a Jacinta Ardern of Malaysia. Maybe she can be the Prime Minister candidate. There are Ong Kiang Meng. Uh, there, there are many candidates that's available. Choose the good ones, number one. And then, of course, uh, the, we need to uh, hold them to the promise. We need to hold them to, uh, that's why the anti-hopping law. Anti-hopping law is the most important law that we need to promulgate to uh, defend and protect our democracy and people's right. Because otherwise, you elect anyone uh, to on a certain particular platform And this guy or girl can simply jump. And that negates everything. Coming back to the system, it is going to be a tough, tough work. Boss, I just took one agency, MDEC, uh, for 15 months. Uh, we studied carefully what is uh, needed to be done. We were building the capacity, uh, brought in new team, uh, built the new uh, proper structure. Uh, we 
came in, uh, came up with the discretionary authorization limit. When the forensics was done, it is not like uh, it is me or my friend. None of the new guys who were appointed in MDEC is someone that I know. It all went through proper process. Yeah? And we brought in KPMG and EY to do the study and came up with these uh, things that we need to do. So we did it. Of course, uh, towards the end, uh, I've been asked to do certain things that I will not do. And uh, that bridges my red line. And therefore, uh, and you know, I had a very good CEO, uh, Surina Shukri. Uh, she uh, worked very hard, very well, very long uh, to get things done. But then again, uh, powers that be, uh, who has the ultimate power, even the board of directors doesn't have the ultimate power. So all that I'm trying to say is, you are right, system is not going to be easy to be changed. But if we don't try, if we don't do it, if we don't start, if we do not bring this awareness to outside, to public, to people, then we will continue to rot like this and God forbid we'll be behind Laos one day. Okay. So why did you leave MDEC? Are you able to share with us? Uh, as I said, uh, I will not, be, uh, uh, will not be forced to do things that I wouldn't do. And therefore, uh, I left. And, uh, and I, made, I made it very clear uh, to, uh, at the time, the, the finance minister, Zafrul, was telling that you need to be a team player. I said team player with principal's boss. So when I could not agree, then I made my decision. And I've already informed him and also informed the, the communication multimedia, the new incoming Anwar Musa, by the way, is a very nice chap, at least the way he handled me. He was very nice chap. And, uh, and I said, look, uh, I'm done. Uh, so long uh, I do not get the independence. And number two, the board is not independent to do the right thing. Then I have to uh, leave. Uh, so that's why I left. Who, who, who was asking you to do something that you did not want to do? I just mentioned uh, one of it is the uh, uh, one of the one of it is the finance minister who wants me to be the team player, and the other one was the the uh, KSU who wanted me to do uh, what speed speed up the grand phenomenon uh, processes uh, and uh, speed to spend the money. Uh, to me, we were just cleaning up. Uh, it's a 25 years organization. It's not easy to clean up. So we clean up. We put in the structure. We put in the people. We put in the system. And then we are ready to go. Then comes this guy uh, saying all kinds of things. And uh, then, yeah, so whatever happened, happened. And then I lost my CEO as well, uh, Surina Shukri, uh, who uh, I defended for more than one year, 12 months. Uh, to... to, to, uh, to it's not easy uh, to, you are right about the system, but at least I'm, I have a little experience now. And uh, this is just a small organization, boss, small agency. Uh, in terms of budget, maybe 200 million, 300 million. But if you put that in a greater perspective of our OPEX and CAPEX, which is about 300 something billion, it's nothing. But I've seen enough there to say, to, to, to conclude. Uh, and I've shared some similar experiences with some other people as well. And uh, former ministers who advised me as well. What I saw is, it's just a small microcosm of the problem. So if you cannot solve the problem at the branch, at the, at, at the, at the leaves. <coughs> you have to solve it from the root. And the root is, in Malaysia, unfortunately, is the power, political power. Okay. While you're having a glass of water, let me ask you this. So in 2016 or 17, you were uh, at the beginning of Bersatu via Tanshri Mohidin and then on to Tun. Now 2021, would you do the same? Are you doing the same? And if so, would you once again uh, stress or advise for a Malay-based political party to change things. And we're talking today, 2021. First of all, I'm still a Bersatu uh, uh, ordinary member. I have not left the party. Um, um, I wanted uh, to think and reflect very carefully uh, on what should I do vis-a-vis -vis Bersatu. This is a party that 
uh, I was involved from day one. I just told you that even the logo was created in my house. I uh, was involved in the writing of the constitution from day one, you know. And so, yeah, there are some, uh, uh, some attachment there. And the other thing is, uh, uh, I really like Tanzri Mohidin Yassin. Uh, this is a man that I got to know since his sacking uh, by Najib. And, and I really like him. He's a nice person. He's very fatherly, at least with me, on a personal level. Having said that, uh, of course, a decision has to be made sooner or later. Uh, the current Bersatu is uh, uh, quite different from the Bersatu that I've, that I've worked very hard at that point of time uh, to co-found. And um, I've been asking to meet up with Tan Sri for the last two weeks. Uh, and I, I understand he's, be, he's very, very tired after Malacca. And there's a lot of things that is his own mind. So I'm going to meet up with him and then I will make that decision. Whether I will do it again, uh, to set up another party is not, uh, is not the way to go as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I don't think I have the uh, wherewithal to establish a, a party. Uh, to establish a party is not easy. Uh, uh, Sadiq is a very, uh, uh, very gung-ho about these things and he did a, a great job. But it's not easy to set up a party. So, uh, what are the platforms that is available? I need to look carefully. The third question that you asked me was whether it's going to be uh, any more uh, a Malay-based party and all that. Uh, Would that be I the think, way to go? Uh, I think uh, it is time for us to have a Malaysian-based party uh, to lead the way. Because uh, this identity politics of race and religion is going to destroy Malaysia. Uh, you saw how uh, I'm not very uh, kind or, or, or very uh, 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 mindful or diplomatic about talking about past because I have experience with past directly uh, with none other than Hadi Awang. Uh, and, uh, and I know uh, what past stands for. And uh, to me, uh, they are the best merchant traders of Islam. Uh, they know how to merchantrate Islam for their political survival. Unlike Nick Aziz, uh, Tuan Guru Nick Aziz, I had an opportunity and uh, ability uh, to go to Hajj with him. And uh, I was in Medina at that time. And I, I interacted with uh, uh, Tuan Guru Nick Aziz quite a bit. Uh, his uh, political uh, uh, secretary or Satya uh, Sulit or whatever, whatever the position was, or special officer, is uh, Rosli, who's actually my school, uh, my university mate. So we had a very good time and understood uh, Nick Aziz. Nick Aziz is very clear, principle. Uh, but our friends these days, not all of them in past, by the way, uh, at least the leadership now, uh, they can go here, they can go there, they can go here. So long position and power is there uh, to be taken. And I, I'm very candid about this and I didn't hide these things. It's all in my Twitter. Uh, many times they will say that rice's blood is halal. So what? The, the most important thing is uh, this, identity, this identity politics of race and religion. Look what happened in, uh, in, in, in the US under Trump and how Trump uh, motivated the guy in New Zealand to go and shoot all the Muslims in the mosque. Look what is happening in the Modi's uh, uh, India today. Uh, and with the Hindu Tua over the Muslims. So this uh, identity politics of race and religion must stop. Therefore, uh, I would uh, endorse going forward, uh, it has to be a Malaysian uh, initiative, uh, a Malaysian party. It has to be that way. Uh, we need to... You see, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know that guy? He's a superpower, the, the biggest... Nobody else bigger than him, huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has banned racism. You know, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have said racism is banned. Haram. You know, he says there's no superiority between uh, black and white and Arab and non-Arab and blah, blah, blah. The, the most uh, closest to God is the righteousness, taqwa. Quran also said that. Hadith also said that. Every ulama, the proper ulama, uh, not just the ulama who wears this and with a, a white dot on the chest. 
all ulama will tell you racism is completely uh, haram in Islam. Uh, if anyone comes to tell you that racism is okay, uh, that is not true. I've just quoted Allah. I've just quoted uh, apa namanya Rasulullah. And if these two guys is not important for them uh, to perpetuate this racist uh, racist uh, agenda, then they are going to be in a severe problem. So going forward, Malaysia must be helmed by Malaysians, and we want capable Malaysians. But of course, we have something called Article One Five Three in Federal Constitution. We have to respect that. That is our constitution. We have to respect that. We need to, uh, you know, they all talk about this affirmative policy. Affirmative policy, if it is look at the policy itself, it's good. It's good. But why don't we tweak it to have that affirmative policy for on the need basis? You you cannot continue helping the two top two percent of the, the uh, top two uh, percent of the Bumi Putra. Why cannot it be? The 98% of the Bumi Putra and those who are in need. Cannot we do that? Why do a millionaire needs a 7% discount on a house? That's that's that, that's uh, that's the thing that we need to uh, think about. I think uh, uh, for the next uh, G15, uh, I'm, I'm telling you this G15 is going to be a very critical election for Malaysians and the way forward. If we get it wrong, we are going to have a lot of problems. Uh, we we must uh, think as a Malaysian, and uh, we must do things for all Malaysians. Uh, nobody, you always say keluarga Malaysia. Huh? Now now they talk about uh, last time was satu Malaysia. Now they talk about keluarga Malaysia. That's why I uh, cynically tweeted, it's not keluarga Malaysia, it's a kelentong Malaysia. Uh, why is a kelentong Malaysia? Because come on, let's be honest. Are we helping all today? The numbers uh, you'll be reading in the op-ed. The numbers that we saw is scary for the next year uh, yeah. with regards to those facing bankruptcy. I'm talking about this is all Bumi Putra, non Bumi Putra, uh, China Putra, Mama Putra, like me, uh, and every Putra, you know. So, how are we going to address that? So, it is time for us to kick this racism. Even the Premier League every day, we talk about no racism, uh, kick it anywhere, this and that. Why cannot we do the same? We should move away from racist policies. We must move away from using Islam for political gain. I think this has to stop. Um, I will leave it at that, Dato, Dr. Rais Hussein. Uh, other than that, just to say that, especially with the last 10 minutes of what you've been saying, I've been totally on the same page with you. I believe that uh, uh, race and religion does not have a place in politics and does not have a place in the current politics of Malaysia. At the end of the day, you know, I truly believe in a better Malaysia. I believe that the best way forward is that we don't separate each other. We, we, we strive more to connect with each other on whatever level. And it's definitely not helping, helping race and religion uh, politics. With that, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show. Um, last question fire quick fire question here uh who'd be the best prime minister right now top of your head like one vote one name go nurul iza very good are liverpool going to win the premiership this year yes <laughs> what is the most favorite film that you have watched recently hellbound Oh, yes, I just caught the last episode of that as well. Uh, and final question, uh, Dr. Dr. Rice. Uh, are you hopeful for Malaysia? I'm very hopeful because I see people like uh, Sadiq, uh, people like Iza, and people, uh, generally Malaysians, uh, they're all hopeful. And I think they want change. Um, we have a serious problem of brain drain. People are leaving, good people are leaving. We are also losing foreign direct investments, like through uh, cable lending going elsewhere. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the the cabbage IQ of a minister who refused to change the uh, Panamani uh, cabotage policy. So, uh, despite all the gloom and thing, I think Malaysia is a beautiful country, protected geographically. We have so many resources, so much of resources. 
We have good, good people. And I think for once, we get together the people and then get rid of people who will again lead this country to uh, problems. I think that is what we need to do. Again, I repeat, there are good people across the aisle. There are some good guys in the in the Barista National. There are good guys in Pakatan Harapan. There are good guys in Prikata National, and God knows whatever. Maybe except us. So, but but at the end, <laughs> what I would say is that go for the candidates, good candidates, and then hopefully, hopefully, they will see our hope because the way it is going now. Uh, I'm also writing an, uh, another op-ed on the currency speculative attack. Uh, we have fulfilled all the criteria of uh, currency speculative attack. Uh, we have we have debts, huge debts. Uh, we have we are taking debts to repay debts, which is not good. And uh, we means the the government, yeah. And then uh, we also have inconsistent policies. Uh, like remember the prosperity tax. Uh, Friday was announced by the by the appointed finance minister Zafro and on Monday we lost about 33 billion ringgit 3 billion ringgit was the aim to collect uh, that was announced on Friday but we lost 33 billion ringgit on uh, Monday Tuesday uh, trading on the KLSE so there are a lot of works to do through uh, there's a lot of but do not lose hope um, you know when uh, Mo Salah wore the t-shirt never give up uh, against uh, Barcelona. Uh, it, it reminds me of that. Never give up. I think Malaysia is, again, Malaysia is such a beautiful country. We have good resources. We have good people. Uh, we have a shining one like you, Harith, uh, who very concerned about uh, what's going on in Malaysia. And I hope all this thing comes to uh, a fruition of uh, something that is better uh, for Malaysia. Otherwise, uh, mark my word, uh, if we do not do the right thing in G15, uh, we are going to have a big issue. Uh, we've lost uh, many grounds. We're going to have a big issue. And with that, I thank you once again, uh, Dr. Dr. Rais Hussein. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your thoughts. And thank you very much for sharing uh, your point of view on the program. I wish you the very best and we'll definitely catch up sometime and watch a Liverpool game together. Okay, thank you. Good night, sir. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Dr. Rais Hussein, one of the founding members of Bursatu, sharing his point of view. I was noticing in the comments section, a lot of people were spewing some um, dislike and hate towards the gentleman. I think basically just reading the point of view of the comments, maybe uh, you didn't actually have a true understanding of where uh, Dr. Rice stands in terms of uh, uh, where his principles are. And I think you're probably more focused on what you thought his party allegiance was. But I hope throughout the conversation that you have perhaps uh, come up with a different point of view. I certainly have, uh, especially uh, towards the end when... Um, he started sharing about his vision for Malaysia and who he thinks. Very interesting choice, uh, Nurul Isa as the Prime Minister. And I saw a lot of positive response to that, a lot of supporters. And I would have to say myself that, you know, I would not be against that very suggestion myself. With that, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who has commented. Thank you so much to everybody who have shared. If you have not shared, this is your moment. What are you waiting for? Please share. Uh, if you are listening on Spotify, thank you for catching us on Spotify. A reminder, we are all, we're on Spotify as well. Uh, just catch us, listen to us while you are jogging, listen to us while you are sleeping. Yeah, just, you know, put it on subconsciously, let it go into your brain, let it go into your head. Guys, uh, just before we leave, I want to say that uh, my joke factory, my comedy club is open right now. Uh, we are open again. We have shows Tuesday through to Saturday. If you are a Tamil speaking individual and you love Tamil speaking comedy, Open Mic Night is on this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, 7th of December, hosted by Suresh from Raga and Hindra Bose. Uh, fantastic comedians. And it's all in Tamil. 
We have restricted SOPs. Seats are limited and it's always full. So get your seats now. On Wednesday, we've got uh, the best of the new young comedians on Long Story Short. That is on the 8th of December. Brian Tan, Rizman Razan Abilate and Mikhail Severchula. And on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, this is something that uh, Rai Sutsin and me will most be interested in the generation gap. We've got three comedians who are in the ages of 50 and above and three comedians who are below the age of 25. So it's all happening at the Joke Factory in Public Health. Please go and check us out on the Joke Factory pages on Instagram and Facebook. And with that, I would like to say terima kasih, skali lagi to all of you who commented, especially to all of you who are, who, are, who are listening, who are watching. I truly appreciate it. I do the show What's going on, Malaysia? Because basically, I would like to find an answer to that question about what is happening to my beautiful country. Uh, was the question answered today? Um, definitely not, but I feel I'm a little bit closer in understanding uh, at least the thoughts of uh, Rais Hussein, as well as yourself in the comment section, that I truly believe, truly believe and echo his thoughts. We have a lot of good people on all sides of the divide, on all sides of the cultural lines and all sides of the race lines and all sides of the religious lines. There are many good Malaysians. All it takes is enough political will for all these good Malaysians to get together and push through the, the policies, the thoughts and the, ma the machinations and the, to make the machinery to change the tracks that we are currently on. Or as Dr. Raisya Tim says, post GE15, if we make the wrong choice, God knows what's going to happen. Oh, Allah bless us all. Thank you very much. Selamat malam sekali lagi. Uh, look out for the next episode of What's Going On Malaysia coming up real, real soon. And with that, uh, it's almost the end of 2021. I do hope that you are safe. I do hope that you are staying healthy. And I look forward to hearing from you. I will get to your comments in just a moment and uh, try and answer each and every one of them. Although that uh, may seem impossible because there are hundreds of comments, if not thousands. Thank you. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum. Good night.